Hi, people. Uh, I'm here to talk about interop with Android, iOS, and WebAssembly in the same project. So basically, a Rust library that you can that you compile to all of those three platforms, and on each of them, you basically have an app that consumes those those libraries. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, so interoperability. When people talk about this, usually they're talking about FFI. So does anybody know what FFI is? Like raise your hands. That's a lot of people. <laughs> uh, so FFI stands for foreign function interface. So basically when uh, like a programming, programming language has like its standard library, its syntax, a lot of things and one of the things that the most popular one ha uh, ones have is a way to talk to the external world. So basically, uh, let's say you have uh, created the, those awesome Rust functions. Uh, I think actually the, it's not very easy to see. So uh, let's say you have created those awesome Rust functions uh, and you want to use them and you need to create, I don't know, a Node.js app or whatever and uh, you want to use them. So you can basically go to, to, to uh, use, create your program and consume them using via FFI. So Rust has a way to externalize, externalize things and also consume things from the external world. Also other languages have that feature. So that's the idea. Uh, but why use this? Um, you can use for various e reasons. One of them is performance. So let's say uh, you're doing a Python program. Like people who do data science, they usually use some common libraries to uh, do some things. And basically, um, they use some Python libraries like to do uh, common things to this domain. And some of the li those libraries are actually written in C. And basically they do Python wrappers around this C code and get some C performance out of that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, you can also uh, use existing code or libraries. So um, let's say there's this new language and you can't create uh, a GUI application for it. So there's no libraries for it. So you can basically get, uh, create a, C, uh, a wrapper around I don't know, some C GTK uh, library uh, using FFI. So basically you talk to a library uh, externally and uh, you can do that on your cool new language. Uh, you can also do uh, FFI to actually concentrate common logic in one, li one library. So basically uh, I'm at my company, uh, Pagarmi, it's a payments company in Brazil. Uh, we're actually, we have an Android app, an iOS app, a web app, and a .NET app that all of them need to talk to that uh, payment terminal, Those, that thing you put your credit card and lose money, you know? Uh, so uh, basically, um, we have a C library that actually uh, builds the commands for that machine, for that payment terminal. But it's actually written in C. We are rewriting it to use Rust uh, for various reasons. I, I won't get into that here, but uh, you can basically concentrate this common logic in one library and consume it in various places. Uh, but how to do this in Rust? So Rust has various features to do this, or tools, whatever. Uh, one of them is the external functional declaration. So uh, when you put this external thing uh, before the function declaration, it basically means you want to, do, to use it externally. Uh, so uh, it, this C string basically means you, 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 uh, you are using the C ABI. You can use other ABIs, but uh, by using this, because most uh, languages have a way to talk with C, uh, when you externalize using the C way, uh, they can read your Rust library. So it's pretty used to, e easy to use. Uh, also, there's the you can create a, an external block that actually does the opposite. So you consume uh, external functions on Rust. So let's say you are operating on iOS and you need to 
use a random function, there are a lot of options there and you just create the signature because the implementation is elsewhere. Um, that's the idea. And there's the no mango attribute that basically does not mango the function name. So that helps other compilers that are not Rust compiler to actually understand the function name and uh, that's the idea. There's also wrap C which basically layouts in memory your structs or, or enums uh, in a C way. Uh, that helps other languages to actually understand it but this is not necessary. Uh, I fin find it very useful for enums but uh, you can use opaque pointers. I will get into that later but uh, it, this is actually not necessary for a lot of cases. So, okay, so how it's the workflow when you're building a library for uh, an external, like, app or something? Uh, you have your Rust library with those external declarations, so you have a lot of functions there uh, that you want to use externally. Uh, you build them to the target you, you want. So when you do only cargo build, it actually uses your OS and architecture and everything to build it. Uh, but you can use this car, uh, target flag that helps you to build for other platforms. Uh, then you will get a .so, .a, it depends on the target. Uh, this file basically will contain your functions uh, that you want to externalize. And then on your program in another language, you consume those functions uh, via FFI. So that's the idea. So for Android, for example, um, you have your Rust library you compile for those three targets, that, that's what people use for uh, Android apps. Uh, and then you will get on your target folder three folders, each one for each one of those targets. But you get those SO files in all of them and these SO files you link them on your Android app and you need to create this JNI libs folder to actually link them. Uh, but this JNI, JNI is basically a part of Java, like in simplified terms, a part of Java that deals with the external world. So it's Java's FFI. Um, and you can maybe create a Java or Kotlin uh, wrapper around this, those functions, those external functions. Uh, for, so let's say you have this cool struct, like uh, it, it doesn't actually have any data in it but it could have. Uh, doesn't really matter for the example. But, um, and then you need to, so to consume on Java, you actually need to create a function on JNI's way of understanding things. So you, there's the no mango. Uh, so here's the no mango uh, attribute, the external function declaration that I've, I've said before. And the name has this awesome name. <laughs> Uh, basically, it, that's the way the uh, Java can enter, understand your function. So you start with Java, then the package name, so cool, uh, com, cool, cool Android project, and, and then your class, and then a method. So that basically acts as, as a class on this package. Uh, and then this function receives an environment and a this. Uh, and uh, the environment, basically it's this object or struct or whatever uh, that you can do things on the, uh, on Java. So you can basically create objects, you can call methods on classes, you can do all kinds of stuff there. Uh, and here this function basically instantiates this uh, struct, uh, this cool struct and it creates a, uh, this cool struct, allocates it in the heap using box and it returns a pointer but instead of return, returning a simple pointer, I convert it to a long uh, type which is basically just an integer, um, a big integer and that way you can have the memory address on your, on Java and when you're gonna call methods on this struct, you can basically pass the long to other uh, JNI functions that you've created and you convert them back to pointers so you can use them in Rust normally. Uh, that's the idea. Okay, so uh, on, on Java you need to create this, just the signature of that external method. So that's the code class, that's the, the package name, the method, the return type, it's 
all like that one. Uh, and you can also like, I don't know, create a private uh, value that contains that construct uh, a memory address. This is Kotlin, by the way. I, I did not say that, um, but yeah. For iOS, basically it's almost the same thing, but you get .a files, and there's a tool I recommend using. It's called Cargo Lipo. Uh, you can do the cargo build target for everything too, but as from I heard, it's pretty complex to actually make it work for iOS. Uh, so just use Cargo Lipo, it would work perfectly. Uh, but instead of creating uh, a like a class, uh, for example, here we created this class to actually have the signature on Java side. Uh, for iOS, you need to create a C bridging header. Uh, so basically, it's a C header file with a bunch of declarations uh, of your extern functions, of your Rust functions, or whatever. Uh, okay. So same struct here. Uh, no mango and extern C, C uh, syntax, and instead of returning a long type because uh, we are not on Java, uh, we return a pointer here, and like we just use this box interval which just gets gets the pointer and uh, returns to to the other side. However, like this works because we are using the C ABI and like uh, Swift and Objective C interact good with, uh, well with uh, C, so that's basically just like a normal, a regular C pointer. Um, and you need to have this, this bridging header which has the struct uh, and the method that returns that struct. So this struct uh, on Rust, it actually didn't have any data, but uh, here I'm doing, like even if it had, you can just create an opaque pointer definition uh, basically, an unpack pointer is just void pointer. I don't know if you have programming in C, but uh, basically, it's a pointer that can point to anything. So, uh, yeah. And for WebAssembly, it's honestly the easiest of them, like to do the interop. Uh, there are two libraries that help a lot with that, which are WasmBindGen and WasmPack. Uh, thank you, Alex. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, Wasm, wasm pack, uh, it's more like a command line tool that you can uh, build your project, and Wasm Bindgen is more like a library. It actually has a CLI, but uh, I, I honestly don't use it. But So you can build your library, and it will create, instead of the regular target folder, you get a PKG folder that uh, basically will contain your .wasm and a .js file. So it actually already creates a, a wrapper around those external functions on JavaScript. And the cool thing about this PKG folder, it actually, you can create a web app that actually consumes it uh, like it was any NPM package. So it's very good for using, like it's very good. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the same function, the same type here, uh, but here you can see that we can just return the type itself, like we can just call my struct nil, uh, just by putting this, importing the wasm uh attribute, and we need to put on our types and on our functions. So you can basically write regular Rust code, and this attribute will read your code and convert to that uh, dirty box thing. Uh, so it will deal with a lot of stuff for you. So I recommend using this library. Um, yeah. So, okay, but I've shown all of these, and, but how to do all of those three at the same time on a Rust library? There's one more tool. Uh, I rec uh, it's needed to do this which is the conditional compilation attribute. So there's this thing in Rust called CFG. Uh, it's an attribute that you can pass a, basically something to ev evaluate, and if it's true, it will actually compile the, the line below. Like the, for example here, I have a wise mo module that will only be compiled if uh, I'm actually targeting for WASM32. So if I build for Android, uh, I won't get WebAssembly code. That, that's like what I want. Uh, so one way to, like, because WASM engine is kind of intrusive, 
uh, because you have to put on your types and on your external functions, uh, you need to put con conditional compilation on your uh, imports, and also there's this CFG ATTR that evaluates a expression like the other one, but actually puts an attribute to the thing below. So that's very useful and makes you not compile WASM things to iOS or other platforms. And also to actually not import uh, WASM bindgen and other, uh, other platform specific things, you need to put this on your cargo tomo file to, it's the same thing but you use it for your dependencies. So there, here there is WASM bindgen and JSSys. JSSys is a library inside of uh, WASM bindgen that has a lot of JavaScript types. So like functions, you have u8 int, uh, u int 8 array, you have a lot of things in there. Okay, so how to structure the Rust library? So at my company, uh, we started with this idea and that actually it's almost this, the, what we are doing. Uh, we, on the libras file, we put our common modules, like of course we don't have a common module, but uh, we have a lot of modules that are our uh, core Rust library and then we can put like, uh, create other modules that use that common module and create a public interface for a specific platform. So uh, on this module, it will basically import this and create functions that WebAssembly can understand and things like that. Just the same for iOS and Android. So uh, that's the, we, the idea we had, but, uh, and, and this is the, like on each of them, you create a public interface for the specific platform you you were building for. Uh, and then, like, for today, I didn't, like, our project, unfortunately, has to be closed source because of regulation issues. However, I did a project for, just for today, which is about the uh, Doom Fire. Uh, I don't know if you have played Doom. It's a game. Uh, and basically, there's this fire on the menu screen that, um, you can like, I basically made a iOS, Android and web app that render this on screen and the logic of doing this is on Rust. So the render part is on the, the platform specific app. So the idea is that basically you will have a vector of pixels, of bytes or numbers, whatever, and each of them uh, represents a number from zero to 36. 36 is very hot. Uh, zero, it's not that hot or code, uh, and uh, you basically a vector like this. Of course, I don't um, I don't export it as just a pixels variable. I have a struct that has that, but uh, that's the idea. So basically, the platform only reads this pixels array or vector, whatever, and reads all, all of those numbers, and that's the intens intensity of the fire that it needs to render on screen. That's the idea. I won't get into many details of how it works, but okay. So basically this is the library. Uh, there, th those are the common modules. And here are the three specific modules. Uh, here's the WebAssembly one, like I've shown, uh, and the Android one. But here you can see there's no iOS. Uh, basically for like, we discovered uh, when we were working on our project at Pagarmi that Basically, uh, exporting functions for iOS, for uh, .NET, for some specific platforms, uh, it's very similar, it's basically the same thing. So we, uh, here I created just a standard FFI module that probably can be consumed by other platforms that are not iOS. So that's the idea. This is the iOS one, but probably works for other platforms too. And here, uh, the Android one actually uses the standard FFI one. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but I've shown that on the Android one, you basically receive long types and convert them to pointers and or return long types that will be the memory address of your structs uh, so that you can call methods and create structs. And this Android module just converts the things that are pointers to longs or uh, vice versa to using the standard FFI module. So uh, here's the library's core logic. It's basically a struct with a lot of methods. And 
uh, that's like the idea. Here's the main logic, and here's the that thing I've shown about uh, only compile WASM things when it's needed. Uh, okay, and then the WebAssembly interface it's very simple. It just like creates the struct, uh, call methods on it. Like you can just receive uh, mutable references, immutable references. It works perfectly. Uh, I, uh, it's very good. And but here there's one interesting thing. Uh, basically, we needed like um, I used callbacks in this project, and there's this function type that, which is from JSS. Uh, that means this is a J JavaScript function, and I created a function that basically converts that function, that extern type, to a Rust type, like. Uh, something that's not platform specific because you don't want to keep on your common modules on your core library uh, things that are platform specific. So this function basically is something like this. Uh, it receives a JavaScript function. It returns a box with anything that implements the function trait and it creates this box and puts a closure in it uh, that calls that JavaScript function. So that way the core uh, li Rust library doesn't know what is a JavaScript function. It only knows things that are Rust types. And here's basically how you use it. Of course we don't use this in Rust. We are using on the other side. But here it's basically you call this function and it will give you the array of bytes that you can render on screen. That's the idea. Okay, so for iOS, there's the standard FFI module, which creates the, the board, and which is the, that struct I've shown, uh, returns the pointer, and the functions basically receive pointers and call methods on them, but of course, do new checks, like uh, check that the pointer is not no. Uh, then you can maybe convert to something you can call methods. And, and then you need to free things, so basically there's this box into raw, uh, from raw function that receives a pointer and then converts into a box type. So a box type when it's out of scope, it will free that memory. So uh, that's how you free things. And the Android interface is just what I've shown before, but uh, it receives like, for example, here this function returns a jlong. And basically it calls this standard if I'm, uh, function that creates a pointer and then returns it as a long type. Uh, and then the functions, like, every time you want to call a method on it, you basically receive the, the integer, which represents the memory address, and then convert it as a pointer. Uh, so that the standard FFI module will do the no checks and call methods on it. Okay, this is the project, like, you can check it later. I have, you can, like, see, oh, this is, weird, this is wrong, this is good, and yeah, that, that's the project. Uh, and uh, that's basically it. So some limitations of uh, doing uh, interop like with Rust and also interop in general. So for example, for WebAssembly, at least using the WASM bindgen project, which is very big and the most used project, uh, you can't use generics or typed parameters uh, um, yet. So uh, you can use them, but you can't export any type that uses it. Uh, also, there's no lifetime parameters, so uh, goodbye references. <laughs> uh, and also for, like, for Android, one thing about Java that uh, at least, like there's no function pointer, so a, a way to call a callback is basically either you receive an object and call a specific method on it, or, uh, you can maybe on the Kotlin or Java interface receive a closure, store it, and you have a method that calls it, but you call that on Rust. Uh, that's kind of confusing, like, we, uh, but yeah, there's no function pointer, so you have to do some things to actually call callbacks. Uh, on iOS, uh, you can do callbacks, but uh, every time you create a, uh, you pass a callback to, to C, uh, because on iOS it will think you're just doing interop with C. Um, you basically uh, can't use data that's on an object, for example. You can't use, if you're on a class, you can't use anything that's related to self or this. Uh, you need to, you only can reference things that are either received on the closure or are static data. So that's kind of annoying too. Uh, and for all of them, at least, uh, 
not much for WebAssembly, but for the others one, other ones, there are very few examples online. Like, um, there, most of the examples are either you pass a string to the other side and come it back, uh, or you add two, two numbers, or you print something. So it's very annoying to find something useful online. Uh, there are some references, though. Uh, I will show them later. Uh, but it's very annoying and was hard to do, uh, at least for me <laughs> and my colleague. And the biggest challenge, in my opinion, was to actually match types between the host and guest language. You can, like, I really, I literally spend hours trying to, like, okay, I have a function that needs to receive an array of bytes. And then I try a type, I try another type, I try another type, and I can, you can keep hours trying to actually find what types actually match because you don't have examples online. So uh, at least I had this problem, it was very annoying. Uh, and uh, some references uh, that help a lot, at, at least help me. Uh, for WebAssembly, there's this book that basically creates the Conway's Game of Life. Uh, I really recommend it. It actually gets uh, kind of deep on WebAssembly. I recommend it. Uh, there's one Android and one iOS tutorial by Mozilla that actually do uh, help you to uh, do all of the linking process and how to build your library. Uh, it, help, it helped me a lot. Uh, but it is a hello world, but it's the, you need to do this like for, to start actually doing FFI with Android and iOS. And for, uh, for Jay and I, I didn't found many examples using Rust. So I found this book that was very helpful, uh, that's for C, <laughs> but, um, some of the interfaces that J and I, the J and I uh, has on C, they actually are similar to the Rust one, so I recommend this book. Uh, and then are there, there are two talks that talk about FF, doing FFI with Rust, I recommend them. They are on YouTube. One of them that gives a lot of tips and shows like, do no checks and do things like care, um, take care because you're dealing with pointers and yeah. And an overview of Rust, uh, of, of Rust FFI, uh, basically shows what I've shown, like some parts, and I recommend watching them. And I would like to thank to some people. Uh, most of them, actually, all of them in this slide are from my company, which is Pagarmi. Uh, she, like Marcella, basically, I don't have a Mac. Uh, so to compile to iOS, I basically borrowed a Mac from her, uh, a 2011 MacBook, so thank you. Uh, uh, also to Felipe, basically he's the guy I'm working with uh, in Pagarmi at this project. Uh, not the Doomfire one, the, like our payment terminal project. Uh, th those people are actually from my company too. Uh, they, I've presented to them a lot of times, like trying to... Um, like practice, and Alan, who is here, uh, he offered to actually, I, so I, that I could use his computer, but uh, I ended up bringing mine, uh, so thanks. <laughs> and also Pagarmi, which is the company I work for, a lot of people helped me there, like Camila, um, uh, Marcia, uh, a lot of people there, Susanna. So, and also thanks to those three people, so Cassiano, I don't know him, but he actually has a project of Doomfire, the, doing the Doomfire on Android, uh, because I don't know Android and iOS, uh, I don't know how to render things on screen, so basically uh, his project helped me doing the rendering part. Uh, Murilo, the same for iOS, and Felipe Deschamps, basically he has a project that collects a lot of Doomfire algorithm uh, 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 implementations on various languages and you can check it out later. Uh, on my project there's a link to it. And that's it, thank you all. Well.